Good morning. Uh, good morning. Welcome to CSIS. Um, we've tried to put out an extra amount of water today for those of you who've uh, walked long distances and need to hydrate. Um, I'm Steve Morrison, director of the CSIS Center for Global Health Policy. We're delighted uh, to come together again this year with our partner, uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation, Jen Cates, the senior vice president of the Kaiser Family Foundation, to review the outcome of the G8 and this year also the G20 uh, with, with special focus on development and global health uh, issues. Uh, this is, I believe it's the sixth year, con sixth consecutive year that we've done this jointly with Kaiser. It's proven to be a very valuable tradition and, and particularly to hear the reflections, the sort of reflex reflections while they're still fresh from those policymakers who are at the table. And we have today uh, Ambassador Lynn Edwards and uh, NSC Director Mark Abdu who kindly agreed to join us. And so we're very delighted uh, to have them with us. I'll come back to them in a moment. Our partnership with Kaiser is among the most valuable that we have enjoyed over the last decade. Uh, Kaiser is a very exceptional institution. It's an operating foundation populated with great talent and sets the gold standard for data analysis and policy insights into health. We'll hear from Jen in a few minutes some of the most recent data, 2001-2008, uh, on OECD commitments. Um, uh, Ambassador Lynn Edwards uh, kindly agreed to come to Washington to be with us today. Uh, he is the special representative of the Canadian Prime Minister to the summits, uh, the Sherpa in the diplomatic language uh, for the summits. He's the former, uh, as of uh, 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 June, he uh, stepped down as the Deputy Foreign Minister. Um, he ha has consecutively served as the Deputy Minister in three uh, uh, different agencies departments um, uh, going back nine years, foreign, foreign affairs, uh, agriculture, and trade, and served as ambassador to uh, Japan and to Korea, has had a very distinguished um, career. Um, we're also very delighted to have Mark Abdu with us today. Mark is the Director for Global Health and Food Security on the National Security Council at the White House. Prior to that, served in many positions at Health and Human Services, most recently as the Acting Deputy Director of the Office of Global Health Affairs. Uh, he's had extensive experience over the last several years in, in the various uh, diplomatic fora uh, in, in pre preparing for the G8 and handling many other issues, uh, including the account preparation of the accountability report that we'll hear more about today. Uh, and um, so uh, brings a wealth of experience on these matters. While I'm on this, I want to quickly thank a number of people who contributed to make, making this event happen. Uh, Seth Gannon, uh, Daniel Porter, Carolyn Schroet, Asad Moten, um, uh, Catherine Streifel, Lizzie Cohen, Suzanne Brundage from CSIS. Uh, from Kaiser, Craig Pulaski and Adam Wexler have been very helpful. And from the Canadian Embassy, uh, Frank Ruddock. And we're joined today also uh, from Ottawa, Ron Garson and Tracy Fife. And great to see you both here today. Um, we'll hear more this morning about the moment of big transition that's underway. I'm going to say a few words about that big transition in terms of the way that the G8 and G20 are evolving. We'll hear uh, a, a brief uh, 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 presentation from uh, Jen Cates on the data that they've just issued, and then we will move to our, to our uh, two presenters, um, uh, and uh, Ambassador Edwards and Mark Abdu, and then we will have a discussion and, and as part of that discussion open to the floor for comments from you. The G8 is an old club. Uh, it's an old and small club of liberal democracies of dominant donors dating back to 1975. Uh, it's important to remember that it didn't really begin to embrace seriously global health and development issues until the second half of the 90s, and that didn't really accelerate until this last decade. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, an, an organization that over time has, has, has acquired a pretty broad agenda of economics, development, security, conflict issues. Uh, it has strong, obviously strong constituencies, both in the alignment with the developing world, but also internally with uh, non-governmental groups and advocacy groups and many of you who are represented here today. In the last decade, there's been enormous activism by the G8. Um, and I think when you see the data that Jen Cates is going to present on the period 2001 to 2008, it's rather dramatic the way the numbers were driven up during that period in terms of commitments on global health. 
And I think the GA can claim uh, predominant credit for having driven that process forward. Uh, there are many other you know, high impact contributions in the last decade. The Global Fund, the Gavi Alliance, many particular initiatives certainly surrounding HIV AIDS, but then broadening uh, in, in recent years. We are th clearly at a turning point and an uncertain turning point in terms of the G8's uh, future and, 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 its, and its role. And I'll just quickly highlight. First is the, the decision taken at, at, at uh, Muskoka to retire the Glen Eagle commitments, which was controversial, difficult, somewhat embarrassing, and to move on. And this was really a decision that was taken that at the five-year mark, it was time to retire this and move forward. Um, that, was, that was an admission that things had uh, become more difficult. I think it was an admission that the protracted global recession, the uh, worsening debt and deficit situations in many of the G8 countries were such that you weren't going to see a, a, a quick turnaround. It also means that we see a concentration of leadership and continued funding in just a small core of states, US, Canada, UK in particular. Um, the accountability mechanism that was rolled out uh, at Muskoka, very important, a very new development in terms of peer review and data collection. Uh, Canada deserves enormous credit for having driven that process forward. Others like Mark, who contributed directly to that, will hear more about that. Uh, it will continue to be a live um, uh, 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 presence in the future in evaluating performance and guidance. We'll hear more today about the MCH initiative, uh, the $5 billion five-year commitment, uh, and, and, and how that was uh, created, how that will move forward. Uh, it, is, it is an important initiative. It's, it's modest. It's important. There are, uns there, there are continued questions around implementation and coordination issues. So there's this unresolved question of, what is the G8's future phase? And hopefully we'll hear more from our speakers today about what kind of continued catalytic role it's going to play under these circumstances. Now, on the G20, we also have a transition underway there. It's a new entity by comparison, only two years old. Uncertain membership and mandate. It was created in the midst of the, of the 2008 economic crisis to, to bring about greater coordination of emerging economies uh, it has yet to demonstrate, really, its ability to fulfill the kind of commitments made, going back to the last several meetings around the G20, with respect to, to bringing about much closer coordination on financial management, uh, de exiting the debt, stimulus, um, uh, exiting the stimulus uh, commitments, managing debt and deficit. Um, what role will it play on development and global health in the long term is an open question. The Koreans have created uh, the um, uh, working group, the new working group on development. There's been some initial outreach in New York at the UN with the World Bank. There's more continuing uh, looking forward, and I hope we'll hear more about that today. Um, but I think when we look at the G20, we need to keep in mind that there are many countervailing pressures operating upon it, many of which would argue not to enlarge the agenda around development and global health in any rushed fashion, and I think we're going to see it quite a bit of, 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 of uh, caution and care moving forward. There are the, the G20 members, the G13, the emerging economies, are certainly seeing a much stronger stake in the developing world. Their, their uh, engagement is matching the power and force in the developing world of the G8 countries. Uh, the G8 troubles are creating a space for them to get involved. Development and global health are promising opportunities. The G20 has already gotten its feet wet in a number of these areas, creating now this new Committee on Development. Those are the forces that are sort of pulling them in that direction. But I think there's also others that will push for, for quite a bit of caution. The emerging powers have very special sensitivities around accountability, transparency, uh, di disclosure of data. We can talk more about that. Um, they have, do not have strong domestic constituencies, arguing for them to take on new new commitments outside their borders in the developing world. And there's the immediate pressure to so do first things first. That is to focus on those immediate macroeconomic policy coordination, regulatory reform, control of debt, exit strategies, all of those economic crisis obligations that are still yet to be really worked out. And there's also great questions around where's the leadership going to come from to move the G20 forward on these and there are clearly risks. Climate change stalled 
as it moved into the G20 orbit. There's no question that uh, international property rights, that viral sovereignty, that all of these issues, if put into a G20 context, might themselves uh, uh, invite more tension and deadlock than they do in terms of inviting forward progress. So with those words, thank you very much uh, for being so patient and for being here with us. I'll invite Jen to show us some quick data. Thank you. I see that Steve's already started to go through my slide presentation. Uh, good morning, everyone. I want to echo Steve's welcome, um, particularly to our guests from the Canadian government and the U.S. government who uh, kindly came to talk about the G8 and, and the experience that they recently uh, went through at the G8. Um, also want to acknowledge our important long-term partnership with CSIS on this briefing, but also on many, many things, as Steve mentioned. It's really been invaluable to us as a, a health organization that focuses on health policy issues to be able to partner with a foreign policy uh, entity and bring those two perspectives together. So what we've always uh, felt with this briefing is that we, we all spend so much energy focusing on what will happen at the G8 and then during the G8 what is happening at the G8. And I think it's important to do a readout on what actually did happen and, and not lose that momentum because it is after the summits where important things uh, should or continue to happen. And at every G8, we look to see what will be the focus, what will be the issues that are elevated. Will health rise to a top agenda item? And if so, what will be the topic? Um, and as Steve mentioned, health has not always been at the top, um, although in the last decade or so, that's really changed. And I would say for the most part, it's been very HIV focused. Um, also at the G8, we look to see what commitments were made. Um, so what we know about this G8 is that there was a health issue at the top of the agenda. It was on maternal and child health and some new commitments were made. And these are important for uh, looking at markers and measuring going forward. What these commitments will lead to is sort of the key question that a lot of us are, are focusing on now. And to help set the stage a little bit, I'm going to, in a sense, do a retrospective, kind of look back and see where the G8 has been. It's not just the G8, but the G8 um, forms the bulk of most of the donor government assistance on global health. And when we, we do this report every year where we look um, at data reported to the OECD by DAC governments on their global health uh, funding commitments and just try to get a sense of trends. I will just uh, one, one thing that we also do is we look at health broadly. We include health, um, which is basic health care, general health issues, as well as re population and reproductive health, which is where HIV and STD um, uh, programs fall, as well as reproductive health programs, and water and sanitation related to health. So we've used a, an expanded definition. Um, as this was up before, and I think there's some notable things in this slide. We also are releasing this report now. The, the report's out there, so I'm just going to spend a couple minutes on a few things. You can see the increase over time overall in official development assistance. That's the, the total numbers at the top. Um, you can also see over that time that health is actually growing uh, as a share of that. Um, what you can't see here are some of the reasons behind this, and that's in our report particularly this very large jump between 2007 and 2008, which we noticed and we thought, well, what was going on there? There were several things driving that that are really important for thinking about going forward. A lot of that increase was due to economic infrastructure projects that are not health related. A portion of that increase was due to uh, ODA for Iraq, Afghanistan, a portion for debt relief, and some of it due to currency exchange fluctuations. So a lot of these things, when you, when you, still, when you take them out of the, the equation, there's still an increase, but not as dramatic. And then, of course, the global economic crisis. And this becomes really important because one of the challenges to analyzing any of these data is that there's a real lag. And so when we were able to look at the quote unquote most recent data, we're looking at uh, budgeting decisions that were made before the global economic crisis really hit. So this is, as, as Steve said, this is really about the G8's legacy and, and the donor government legacy on global health, more looking back and not clear going forward. This just breaks down um, that those total amounts over time by the sectors. The main point to take away here is that health has risen as a share of overall development assistance. It's always been favored um, as an area. Uh, other big areas are economic infrastructure, <coughs> multi-sector, which is, um, it combines a lot of different things um, uh, that doesn't fall into these other categories. 
We also, speaking of this 2000 to 2000, 2007 to 2008 increase, we were really curious what was driving that increase. What were the factors that contributed to a $31 billion increase in official development assistance over that one year period? And you can see here, it breaks it down by the different sectors that drove it. And the biggest thing, as I mentioned earlier, was the economic infrastructure projects, also multi-sector um, efforts and commodity aid. Health drove 10%, but it certainly wasn't the biggest driver, as we, would, we wouldn't expect it to be. But this, is, I think, is a helpful gauge as to what was driving that increase. We also always look at the donors that are contributing um, to Health ODA. And as you can see here, the US is the largest, and that's increased over time. And then by region, um, Sub-Saharan Africa is the largest region, and that's also increased over time. And again, all of these data are in, in the report. Um, so this is just a flag for you. And one thing I'm not showing here is the subsectors of health. So if you look below these numbers, you can see what's driving the increase in health, and it's largely been HIV-AIDS um, uh, funding. So a few take-home messages and a sort of a forward look. Um, I think you know, it's very clear ODA for health has increased over the period that we looked at, um, even if you adjust for inflation and exchange rate and look at all these other factors. But some real caveats to think about. The first um, being, as I mentioned, the, the lag in data. Um, and the budgeting decisions that we're looking at here were before the crisis. So it's not clear what they will mean for next year or beyond that. And we've already seen a, a slowing growth rate in health. I didn't show that here, but it has been slowing. So is there caution that's warranted going forward? Um, on the one hand, as we see from the G8, uh, there's still attention to global health. Um, there's the new initiative that was launched. There's the MDG Review Summit in the fall. There's the GHI by the US government. So there's still a lot of momentum around putting forth global health initiatives. On the other, if you look at the OECD's recent data on what's happening with official development assistance writ large, not on health, but just generally, it's actually relatively level between 2009 and 10, even in, re you know, in real and nominal terms. And some donors are actually decreasing and some are increasing. So it's not clear what this will mean. So going forward, it'd be really important to monitor how health fares in that equation um, and look at other markers in the near term, since it's, there's such a lag in the data. One marker, for example, is that what we'll talk about today is the fulfillment of some of these commitments. The other is to look at countries like the US, the UK, that tend to be the biggest donors and see what their, what their um, funding ac amounts actually are. Global Fund Replenishment is in the fall, the MDG Summit. These are all uh, forward markers. I'll also flag a report that we're going to release in about a week and a half um, on funding for AIDS by donor governments, which will actually provide some new data, more recent than this, which will give, I think, a little bit of a picture as to what might be happening. Um, and just to wrap up, one thing uh, to bring up Steve's point on the G20, I think the question of the G20 as donors um, is, is an, an important one to think about. If you look at the G20, there are, five, there are 10 G20 members that are not in the DAC. And of these, five were global fund donors, three donated to Gavi, and two to Unit Aid. So they are um, poised in some fashion to potentially be donors. And six are actually, six of these non DAC uh, G20 members are classified by the World Bank as upper income countries. So um, what their role is will, will be important to monitor going forward. With that, we will hopefully hear from our government experts about what we can think about looking forward. Thanks. Um, thank you, uh, Stephen, for the very kind introduction. Uh, it's very uh, very good to be here. I am pleased to see Washington's a tiny bit hotter than Ottawa. I thought I was getting out of the hot town, but uh, I came to a hotter one. Um, it's great to be here for a number of reasons, um, the weather perhaps being not one of them, uh, but uh, to actually have a chance to talk a bit about the summits. Um, uh, it's only been a week and, uh, and three days since we wrapped up uh, two back-to-back -back summits in Toronto and in Muskoka. And I think uh, it's probably a, a unique that we, that any country has really organized these size of events back to back with them. And they truly were, I believe, uh, quite an extraordinary uh, set of events and conjunction of, of issues and so forth as what I think has been pointed out as uh, 
what used to be a, a single summit that we developed countries looked forward to around the G8 has now become a series of G8 and G20 summits. And I'm, I'm pleased to comment on that and, of course, in our discussion period which follows. Um, I think what I'm going to do in order to set the stage for a good discussion is, is focus primarily on the G8 and, and talk a bit about, uh, about the health uh, aspects of, uh, of the G8. Um, well, first a few general comments about how we approached uh, this G8. And this is against the, the background of the, uh, of the fact that the G20 has been created. My Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, was very clear to me what he wanted uh, when uh, we set out on this road uh, last September, really, to start to work on these two summits. Uh, he wanted to have Canada look at the G8 and go to what he called a back-to-basics approach. Uh, and by that, uh, it means to really try and find where the true value added of the G8 lies in a world in which we now have the G20, part of this evolutionary process that Stephen referred to. Uh, we felt that what we needed to do was play to the strengths of the G8, uh, which is a, a, a group of leaders from developed countries, uh, a, a, an organization where intimate and frank conversation is the norm, uh, where uh, we can deal with uh, economic issues uh, in passing, but pass those on to the G20, but where we could really focus on two areas of strength of the G8. And one was the development agenda, and the other was peace and security. Uh, early on in the process, we then turned our attention to how we would approach the development agenda. And you know, as you know, uh, it has been for some years now, part of the practice in the G8 to get together with a, a group of African leaders. Um, and Africa focus has always been a key part of the G8, and we decided uh, to continue that practice. The Prime Minister ended up inviting uh, seven African leaders to, that, to, to the summit. And then we turned our attention to what we would do under the development heading. Um, and again, here the practice in the past has been uh, to focus, and as has been described, health has been a a growing and important part of, of G8 development agenda. And we had to select something, and it became quickly evident, and the Prime Minister came to this decision back in December, that we would focus on uh, MDGs 4 and 5, uh, maternal and child health, or child and maternal health, I guess, to match up against the, the MDGs. Um, and uh, that this was uh, something that fit well with the progress into 2010 when uh, the UN would be holding its, uh, its MDG summit uh, in, uh, in September, the high-level conference to review the implementation of the MDGs. And the two MDGs where progress has been least uh, were MDGs 4 and 5. Um, it didn't take very long in shopping this idea around. Uh, here in Washington, of course, uh, it received extremely favorable response, uh, and in other capitals, to realize that this was really, uh, you might say, a no-brainer. Uh, that this was an area where uh, the, the world was crying out for attention and where uh, the, the, the strength of the G8 as a, as a catalyst, as a leader, as a convener uh, could really be helpful going into 2010. Uh, so this uh, is how we started the process and, um, and I'll just describe a little bit of how we, we got to Muskoka. Um, the work of the UN is important in this respect. The United Nations Secretary General is calling for a joint action plan which is focusing on, on women's and child health. He had a meeting in April which we went to. Um, and we wanted to ensure that what we did focused very much or in, and collaborated very much with what the UN was doing so that we could in fact give a boost to the UN's efforts and it would be seen as part of it. Again, um, the logic was incontrovertible. Hundreds of thousands of women die each year as a result of pregnancy and childbirth. Um, and progress on, on child mortality is slow and uneven. Millions of children die each year, even before their fifth birthday. And as you all know, if you follow this subject, uh, millions of these deaths can actually be easily prevented uh, through access to public health services that we take for granted in Canada and the United States and so on. So we did believe that the G8 could make a tangible difference in improving the health of women and children in developing countries. So we took a very straightforward approach as the, as the chair of the G8. Um, we went and saw the World Health Organization. Uh, they told us that the game changers would be to focus 
on health systems uh, to ensure availability of public health services along the full continuum of care from pre-pregnancy to childhood. Uh, we took their advice and working with our G8 uh, uh, partners, including the United States, of course, very much at the forefront of this effort. Um, we focused the initiative squarely on scaling up investments in health systems uh, to improve access to health services, as I said, along this continuum of care. For example, uh, sexual and reproductive health care and services, including family planning, the ability to give birth in a healthy facility attended by trained health workers, pre- and postnatal visits with a health care worker, childhood immunizations, well, you know it, prevention and treatment of HIV, AIDS, malaria, diarrhea, pneumonia, safe drinking water, sanitation, and nutritious food. So once we determined where, what we would include in this, and there was a fairly significant uh, work went into this within the G8, working with the OECD and others, we then focused on the issue of securing new resources. And what we wanted to get here, and I emphasize this, was new and additional money. We wanted to scale up investments to support the services we've just identified. And with its launch at the summit, uh, G8 members committed uh, to, as you've heard, $5 billion in new and additional financing for maternal and child health out to 2015. Now, let me emphasize that this is new money. Uh, there's nothing double counted. Uh, there's no recycled announcements. There's no robbing Peter to pay Paul. This is all new. Um, we're also extremely confident uh, that this figure will increase significantly in the years to come. And uh, as the declaration out of Muskoka says, we expect to mobilize significantly more than $10 billion, uh, by 2015. So that was the G8 portion. But there's much more, much more uh, to this initiative. And indeed, uh, it was part of it very right from the beginning. Because very quickly, we reached out to other countries uh, to join us. Um, and to see whether or not they would be interested in building a partnership around this initiative, even though they weren't going to be in Muskoka, if they would be ready to have their contributions listed uh, in the declaration, have their countries listed in the declaration. And so, Netherlands, Norway, New Zealand, uh, Republic of Korea, Spain, Switzerland, uh, all joined in and are mentioned in our Muskoka communique. We then went to the foundations, and here I pay particular tribute to, to the Gates Foundation, who stepped forward uh, at a very critical time to announce a $1.5 billion uh, uh, sum uh, over five years. This was hugely energizing uh, to the whole process. And uh, for those governments within the G8 that were still thinking about it, uh, it sent a signal that this was a very serious initiative and that we had strong outside support. Uh, the United Nations Foundation also joined in, and there were others as well. So what we had at the end of the day was a $5 billion commitment from the G8, uh, joined with a $2.3 billion commitment uh, from uh, non-G8 sources, both government and non-governmental. I think this is the special thing about the Muskoka Initiative, and that is it's more than a G8 initiative. Um, and it, it played to what I said earlier are part of the strengths of the G8, its ability to catalyze, its ability to convene. And so this so coalition of the committed, you might call it, uh, which we rolled out in Muskoka, I think sets a very important example of what the G8 can do and what we can even do in constrained economic circumstances. Uh, and the coalition, uh, I think, this approach, this partnership approach, which has been used before, but in this particular instance around new and additional resources, provides a, a, a good example uh, for further efforts going forward. Now, we see that the coalition have committed broadening in the months ahead. Uh, in fact, uh, later this month, the African Union Summit will be held in Kampala. Uh, it, too, is choose chosen maternal and uh, infant and child health as its theme uh, for the summit. And as I said, we have been working very, very closely with the United Nations. And the UN Secretary General is leading development uh, of, a, of a joint uh, action plan on the health of women and children for agreement at the September uh, MDG summit. Uh, for Canada, if I may put in an advertisement for my own country, um, we committed uh, of that $5 billion, $1.1 billion. Uh, which, in fact, adds to, uh, I believe I'm right here, $1.75 that we already spent on, on this, 
Um, and for, for 2.85, I think, total. Am I right, Tracy, on this? So um, a part of the, the figures that you see for the G8, uh, Canada is a significant contributor. Um, we hope, of course, uh, that uh, this ongoing effort that we have been part of uh, will result in some significant further resources uh, at the MDG uh, summit in, uh, in, uh, in September. Now, uh, something about accountability, um, and that is that we have built that into our uh, plans. Um, uh, we work closely with leading agencies and institutions, such as the OECD, the World Bank, and others, to define uh, what would be included in the, in the funds. And now we have set up a tracking mechanism to do this. Um, I'm going to come back to accountability in a second, uh, but let me just turn quickly to the other thing we followed up uh, in, in Muskoka, and that was food security. The L'Aquila uh, Food Security Initiative was launched, as you know, um, with $22 billion committed towards sustainable agricultural development. Um, and uh, the only other issue that, apart from maternal health, that we really focused on um, at, uh, at Muskoka was to continue to drive this initiative. Um, this was an initiative of President Obama's last year. We joined in. We put uh, $600 million new dollars, uh, on the table to help meet uh, our share of the commitment. So we've been working closely with the United States and with others, other G8 partners, to ensure that this commitment is made. Um, the accountability process uh, around the uh, around L'Aquila fed into, in fact, the accountability report, um, which, uh, as uh, as uh, as others have pointed out, is a bit of a landmark achievement for the Muskoka summit. Let me now uh, turn my attention then to uh, the accountability. I know you have some interest in this and. Perhaps I, I could just cover that before I conclude. Um, accountability, we believe, uh, is one of the outstanding features of the Muskoka Summit. Um, I remember last year in, in Italy uh, when Prime Minister Harper uh, mentioned this at the leaders meeting that he was going to make accountability a foundation piece for the G8 going forward. We had at the back of his mind, he had at the back of his mind, uh, that again the credibility of the G8 had to rest on being accountable. And we had long been criticized uh, by NGOs and by our developing partners in the third world and elsewhere that we made big st fancy statements, but we didn't li live up to the words. And so we felt that we had to bring a new spirit of accountability uh, to the G8. We, it was always our sense that the G8 had a good story to tell in development. Uh, not a perfect story, but a good story. But we needed to improve the telling of it. So we're very pleased that with, uh, uh, with, our, with our presidency and with the support and leadership of others in the G8, we did re release the Muskoka Accountability Report, uh, Assessing Action and Results Against Development-Related Commitments. The report shows that the G8 is advancing credible responses to meet development challenges. For example, between 2004 and 2009, G8 development assistance increased by over 40% to more than uh, U.S. $82.2 billion. Uh, the G8 uh, has provided about 80% of all resources to the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria. The G8 provides about 50% of all funds to the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. G8 members have cancelled significant levels of debt, referred to earlier, freeing billions of dollars for developing countries to use more productively. The G8 has played a leading role strengthening countries' capacities to prevent and resolve conflict. In fact, the G8 has surpassed its commitment in this respect. We said we would train 75,000 troops for peace operations by 2010. We have actually done 130,000 troops. A direct outcome of G8 support is increasingly effective African Union-led peace uh, missions. However, this is not a perfect story, as I said. And we, had, we were prepared to, 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 to find ourselves falling short in a number of areas. Uh, while Canada, the United States, and the United Kingdom have met our national Glen Eagles commitments on aid volumes, some G8 members have further to go. Uh, we need to remain focused on the L'Aquila food security commitments as well to ensure we achieve the $20 billion that were the objective. There were $22 billion pledged. This is a landmark document. Uh, I think uh, for the G8 going forward, it has to become an annual exercise. And I'm pleased to say that uh, the, Fran the French, who will be hosting next year, have already identified that food security and health 
will be the focus of the 2011 accountability exercise. Um, the accountability report helps to further <coughs> ensure continuity and attention to earlier centennial uh, GA commitments. Maybe just a final word then about the G20. It's been referred to and perhaps there'll be some discussion uh, shortly on this, but um, I, I think that this is a work in progress. Um, uh, the G20 agenda, as it broadens and takes on other issues, will likely see a greater convergence in subject matter between it and the G8. Uh, the area of development is the one where I think um, the jury is still out as to what, what, can, what can happen. Now, of course, you know, the, GA, the G20 is already involved in development issues uh, right from the very beginning. Uh, part of the outcomes, and I refer to London particularly, uh, were around the resourcing of international financial institutions. And indeed, in Toronto, we celebrated success uh, by, uh, by concluding the general capital increases for the multilateral development banks, which uh, put about 350 billion new dollars <coughs> Uh, at the disposal of the banks and doubled the amount of lending capacity available. Uh, we also launched something called the SME Challenge. If any of you are interested, you probably know about it already, but this is quite an innovative new uh, financing uh, approach. And we canceled Haiti's debt. So where's the G20 going to go on development? It will certainly deepen at the Seoul Summit. Um, Korea has made it clear as the next chair they would like to see development as a, to be a centerpiece or one of the centerpieces of their summit. They have several themes they'll be pursuing, but this is certainly one uh, they want to pursue. Um, and we in Toronto um, saw the launch of a working group uh, under the Sherpas uh, that will help define the scope and subject matter for Korea's development plans. Our first meeting of this group actually is going to be taking place later this month, and I think there's even a preparatory call uh, this week that my, my staff will be participating in. Um, when you look at the areas, they're very broad. Um, the, the paper that has been circulated, I believe, at the UN just in the last few days, uh, talks about nine areas, uh, infrastructure, human resources development, trade, financial inclusion, food security, already there in a way, <coughs> governance, uh, something called the platform for, no, for knowledge sharing, uh, and uh, the list goes on. Uh, personally, I think that this is very much uh, a, a work in progress, as I said. Um, the Koreans themselves realize that greater focus is going to be have to be brought to this agenda by the time Seoul rolls around, and it's only uh, four months away. Uh, I expect that there's some hard work to be done here. Um, I still think, though, that there is a complementarity between the G20 and the G8, even in the development area. Uh, the G8 represents still the major donors. Uh, the G20 represents, I think, a, an opportunity to discuss the broader role that development plays in economic recovery. Uh, I think that the inclusion of, uh, of additional African members as participants in the G20, as we did in Toronto, we had Malawi representing the African Union and Ethiopia NEPAD, uh, offers an opportunity for the developing world uh, to be part of the new framework which came out of Pittsburgh and which was confirmed in Toronto. So I see development in that sense very much at home in the G20 and providing a lot of, of, uh, of I think, very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting uh, uh, opportunities for engagement. And of course, it will bring in the new emerging economies that need to play their bigger role uh, in, on development. So um, I think the differing nature of the two groups will still um, mean the two, thing, the two groups have uh, specific roles in, in development and it will be distinct for some time to come. Of course, one can never predict the future. And um, as was pointed out, uh, the role of the G8 has itself evolved considerably over time, which then takes me back to your comment, Stephen, about uh, the fact that uh, in the mid-90s we weren't doing much on health. and now. It's a major part of what we do. So I expect some of the G20 work is also going to evolve in that fashion. Perhaps I'll conclude with these, these co this comments, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much.
Thanks, uh, Jen and Steve. It's uh, great to be here, and uh, it's particularly a privilege to be on this panel with uh, our Canadian colleague, uh, Ambassador Edwards. Uh, and kudos to the Canadians for doing a great job uh, in uh, getting us to a number of significant outcomes, uh, including the Muskoka MCH initiative. And it's no uh, small feat that the Canadians were able to pull off two back-to-back -back summits of this complexity uh, and uh, to this degree of success. Uh, they were even able, actually, to get uh, the health experts all to eat antelope in Geneva at that uh, matter. And so you know the level of planning and detail that they have put into uh, <laughs> developing the summit. I'm not going to focus uh, much on the G20, other than to say that I do uh, agree with Ambassador Edwards that uh, it is a work in progress, the G20's uh, relationship to development, and that uh, we'll know more uh, coming out of uh, the Seoul Summit uh, as to uh, what uh, that work in progress is transforming into. Uh, I would say that uh, it strikes me that the G20 is a sort of logical place to focus on economic growth uh, and uh, broad-based growth as a driver of development and making uh, the next generation of emerging emerging economies that can join the global economy uh, and uh, foster sustainable outcomes uh, to basic human service needs for their uh, people. Instead, I'm going to focus on a few things related to the G8, uh, namely global health, uh, and their accountability, uh, the MCH initiative, and uh, development. As a backdrop to the G8 summit, uh, our president, President Obama, uh, recently released his national security strategy. In that strategy, the U.S. recognizes development as a moral, strategic, and economic imperative. Countries that achieve sustained development gains are more capable partners. They can engage in and contribute to the global economy, and they provide citizens with the opportunity, means, and freedom to improve their lives. The president will also be issuing a new development policy in the near future. And at the start of the Muskoka summit, he previewed that policy in a fact sheet uh, called the U, uh, New U.S. Approach to Development. It's on uh, whitehouse.gov for those who are interested. And this development policy will focus on sustainable development outcomes by promoting broad-based economic growth, democratic governance, investing in game-changing innovations that have the potential to solve long-standing development challenges, and building effective public sector capacity to provide basic services over the long term. The policy also puts a premium on selectivity, leveraging the expertise and resources of others, mutual accountability, and on evidence of impact. This new approach served as the foundation for the outcomes the U.S. hoped uh, to help uh, achieve at the summit. With regard to accountability, President Obama takes accountability very seriously, and I think both the Global Food Security Initiative and the Global Health Initiative ably demonstrate this. Canada showed tremendous leadership in coordinating a serious accountability process and an accountability report that provides a candid assessment of G8 efforts. In health, we're doing pretty well, though there's certainly much more that needs to be done. The report is pretty frank about G8 countries' achievements and failures, and it makes clear that we need to redouble our efforts to meet our commitments. That's remarkable progress from where we were just a few years ago in the nascent accountability exercises under the German and Japanese presidencies. Just as donors ask our partners in the developing world to honor their commitments, we need to meet ours. This is tough, especially uh, in tight budget times. But the credibility of both our governments and the G8 depends on it. And we do our partners and ourselves no service or favors when we make commitments and fail to honor them. This commitment to accountability and transparency guided our approach to the Canadian Muskoka MCH initiative. Four months into office, I'm sure you all know, uh, President Obama signaled an increased emphasis on maternal and child health when he announced the six-year, $63 billion global health initiative. The Muskoka initiative, which will reduce the number of maternal, newborn, and under five child deaths in developing countries by supporting strengthened country-led health systems and enabling the delivery of key interventions along the continuum of care, complements that increased emphasis and in ways uh, builds on it. The GHI has been clear and transparent in what it will achieve over six years. 
the targets are out there. Everybody's seen them, and most of uh, the global health world has commented on them, it seems, from the level of mail we've gotten uh, about the initiative. We took that lens to uh, Muskoka. Our objective was to work with our G8 partners to ensure outcomes were the headline for the initiative. Of course, to achieve outcomes, we need funding. That's a given. But in the G8 context and in the development field more broadly, we've tended to focus too much on funding inputs and not enough on what we hoped that funding would achieve. We needed to change that. And under Canadian leadership, we did pretty well in terms of putting outcomes first when we make commitments and relying on data and evidence to guide our interventions. Our metric for success, of course, shouldn't be dollars spent, but instead actual lives saved. When it came time for the United States to make its funding commitment, we also wanted to be credible, transparent, and accountable. Having a big number in a communique is great, but if we do that and don't deliver the goods later, as I said earlier, we do our partners and ourselves no favors. And it's better for our partners, to be perfectly honest, to know exactly what we are committing and what they can expect, and uh, they can then uh, bank on that. These principles are particularly important in times of fiscal constraint, and we owe it both to our domestic constituencies and to those we hope to help through our assistance to be absolutely uh, clear as to what we are committing. So. We took credibility, transparency, and accountability into account uh, when we announced our uh, commitment to the MCH initiative. That commitment was $1.346 billion above our fiscal year 2008 uh, baseline. Uh, that commitment covers our fiscal years 2010 and 2011 and uh, is in support of both the MCH initiative and programming through the Global Health Initiative. The U.S. commitment uh, is, uh, as far as we can tell, the largest uh, commitment over the 2008 baseline to the Muskoka Initiative. And when you add the baseline uh, with our com uh, commitment itself, uh, it uh, is roughly uh, 2.6 something uh, billion dollars. What this doesn't uh, represent, to be perfectly uh, transparent, is additional funding commitments above what the President announced in May 2009 in total for the Global Health Initiative. Our number is derived from the MCH family planning and malaria elements of enacted levels in fiscal year 2010 and the fiscal year 2011 President's budget. And on the um, malaria level, it's imputed at 89 uh, percent, given that uh, malaria interventions, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, are overwhelmingly targeted at under five children and uh, women of reproductive age. We only were able to commit uh, two years uh, at this point in time to the Muskoka Initiative. Uh, this commitment, again, is based on the President's approach to development and the new business model we're implementing through the Global Health Initiative, both of which rely on rigorous evaluation of the impact of our programming to guide decisions related to future funding commitments. The good news is that the global health field has grown and matured. We've learned a great deal over the last decade about what works and what doesn't, and about the difference between inputs and outcomes and about the importance and availability of the facts that can drive our, our analysis. So we plan on using the data and evidence gener generated through uh, the implementation of the GHI in the fiscal year 2010 and 2011 as the basis for determining our global health funding allocations for uh, fiscal year 2012. In terms of the specific interventions uh, in the Muskoka Initiative, uh, one of the great things about it is it's not uh, too prescriptive. There are, uh, there's a general body of evidence about uh, what's needed and what worked. Uh, and uh, G8 uh, and the other uh, partners in this initiative are able to uh, implement those uh, according to their uh, policy and programming uh, objectives and priorities. What this presents is an opportunity. In order to really make sustainable uh, progress. Uh, the President uh, believes that we need to begin to forge a deliberative uh, division of labor. We don't all need to be working uh, in the same field, in the same place. We need to play to our uh, respective uh, added value. 
And so this is something that I hope as uh, we move forward uh, in implementing uh, the MCH initiative, we can really take a look at to see how we can leverage uh, each other's uh, strengths to uh, afford greater uh, coverage and uh, create better outcomes for the people that we're trying to help. So I think uh, that was probably enough of me talking and uh, I'm going to stop there. And uh, thanks again for coming. Um, thank you very much. Mark and Lynn. Uh, I'm going to ask Jen to kick off our discussion here with a question. Would you like to do that? I actually I do have a question for, for Lynn um, specific to what the French are already beginning to talk about regard, regarding next year's summit. Um, what has been stated to us thus far? Um, what will be the next steps? I, mean, I think a lot of um, rather than lose momentum to think about the G8 going forward, we should all be thinking about what the points of intervention or, or opportunity are going forward. So. Well, it's a um, tough question to ask because France isn't represented on this panel. Um, and I, uh, I don't want to venture into ground where I'm speaking on behalf of, uh, uh, of, of my French colleagues. Uh, all we know uh, is that, the, um, is that as, as I said earlier, that the accountability uh, approach will be continued by the French and that we're going to be focusing on the two areas I mentioned, uh, food security and, and maternal and child health. With respect to G20 pra G8 practice, however, um, the next presidency really doesn't begin to make its plans known until into the autumn, and then they only assume presidency in January. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll have to be a little patient to, uh, before we can get a clear, a clear sense of what, uh, what the French are going, to, are going to pursue. Um, but uh, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, all members of the G8 believe strongly that the G8 can, must continue to deliver value, must continue to focus on its core, uh, its core competencies, and, uh, and I expect that the French will continue to ensure that the G8 plays a very, very strong and useful role next year. That's a diplomatic answer. It works. Hope you don't mind. Appreciate it. Let me just follow up there. Uh, the, what I hear from your two presentations uh, with respect to the G8 is that certainly on behalf of the Canadian government and the United States government, a continued faith and belief in the value of the G8 in driving forward the development agenda, a big shift towards the accountability and measurement of impacts, a focus in the near term upon two principal issues of the Food Security Initiative and the MCH, and this kind of outreach function of trying to, uh, in the case, uh, in, the, in the midst of constrained budgets, and tighter, tighter scrutiny of where the dollars are going. Not only are you looking towards stronger accountability mechanisms, but you're also, you gotta look outside yourselves to new partners, right? Mm -hmm. And so the G8 is, is doing that. Now, on the G20, I hear you saying that um, it's a work in progress. Um, there is this, division between, I mean, the, G, the G20 contains the G8, and it contains the emerging markets. It contains the non-DAC. It, 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 it contains very wealthy countries that are large emerging markets that have quite a bit of resources that mostly are going towards internal purposes. Or they may have elaborated foreign assistance programs like China does that are highly branded and highly bilateral. So if the G8 is looking to continue to push in this way, accountability with a focus on a couple of core issues like food security, maternal and child health, I assume also the HIV AIDS agenda does not fall away. The malaria agenda, as we've heard from Mark, that does not fall away either. How does, how does the G8 imagine crossing that divide in order to, to bring the the powerful emerging emerging economies which have become donors unto themselves with equal, if not greater, power and influence in the developing world in terms of the marketplace, for the struggle for influence. Uh, if you look at the numbers in terms of trade, concessionary financing, bilateral direct assistance, the Chinese are, are, are shoulder to shoulder with any of the G8 donors, and you can make a similar argument, less dramatic, but a similar argument with some of the other BRICS countries. How, does it, how do you imagine the G8 leadership, the UK, the US, Canada, 
cracking that nut and trying to pull into these, uh, these coalitions those that are absent today. I mean, your MCH had a little bit of modest Korean involvement, but it was really the end states, the New Zealand and uh, Norway and Netherlands, and then a little from Switzerland and a little bit um, uh, from whoever else I'm forgetting here. But there was not, it was notable that there was an absence of a commitment coming uh, towards that MCH initiative from any of these powerful uh, emerging markets, except for Korea making a modest commitment. Can you talk about that? Well, in, in terms of uh, a global health agenda for the G20, uh, there, there clearly isn't one. And I think where the G20's real value add is, is as a, an entity that can figure out a pathway to help uh, the very poor countries and uh, developing countries mm -hmm. really access the global economy. And that's mm -hmm. uh, really what's needed for sustainable long-term uh, economic growth and development uh, across the board in uh, mm -hmm. many of those countries so that they can begin to uh, put into place the policy decisions and legal and regulatory reforms uh, that are really necessary to uh, produce the types of development outcomes that lead to uh, sustained provision of basic human needs uh, and services. Uh, and so that's really where I think the, the value add is, and I think mm -hmm. that that's what the G20 is uniquely uh, positioned uh, to do and, and is moving in that direction under the Korean leadership. But presumably, when you were looking for donors towards the MCH initiative, you talked to the BRICS countries, right? Well, we did some talking, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but we, to be honest, uh, we went to the countries where we felt that there was uh, uh, a ready uh, yeah. opportunity mm -hmm. to, to, to create partnerships. Uh, this is an ongoing effort. Uh, yes. I mean, it didn't end in Muskoka. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think going into the review of the, uh, the Millennium Development Goals of the September, getting to the right. UN context, this yes. is when we begin to expand that partnership yes. and engage them. I agree entirely with Mark, by the way, about the G20. I think the, you know, um, uh, the G20 has been very focused on, on, a, on its own core agenda. <coughs> around uh, economic recovery mm -hmm. and, all, and the regulatory reforms and so on, with a good bit, as I pointed out, of, of contributions towards development with mm -hmm. the multilateral development banks and so on. And, and Toronto, in fact, uh, uh, called for a, a very healthy replenishment of the IDA under the World Bank mm -hmm. and the African Development Fund. So we see that playing there. I think if we can get within this context of a, of a, of a, of a discourse around the the global economic model mm -hmm. for, the, for the global economy of the future, in which developing countries, including the poorest, pay a role. That would be, I think, a very important outcome from a so-called development agenda uh, in the G20. I, I worry, frankly, uh, uh, that uh, if we go too quickly into too full a development agenda in the G20, we will lose our focus on the real core things mm -hmm. that we still have to accomplish in the G20, which is to get global recovery uh, in place. Yes. Can I follow up on that? I mean, the, when you look at what's happening in the, in the creation of the development working group for the G20, um, it's been surprising to see the speed and the scope of outreach that, that has happened, right, in terms of the, the, the solicitation of input at the UN, the World Bank, and now a number of others. This paper that's circulating that's very broad, um, as you say, covers the full waterfront in terms of possibilities, <coughs> nine different categories. Can you comment a bit on that? I mean, I'm quite surprised that the Koreans are taking that approach because when you, when you hear them talk publicly, they say, we are not opening a Pandora's box. We're going to open the window in a very controlled and, 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 and um, focused fashion because we understand what may happen along the line. But here we have a process that looks quite different. It looks like a very much of a, let's throw the doors open and hear what we hear. What we hear. Well, again, I, like I can't speak for the French. I can't really speak for the Koreans either. Um, but, uh, but they have been close partners this year. We mm -hmm. have, we've had these, these summits uh, within the same year. And uh, I know that, that from the Korean point of view that they still want to focus on these core issues that the G20 must continue mm -hmm. to drive forward. Um, uh, but uh, I, I think that, it's, uh, as I said earlier, it's a bit of a work in progress. I think they've cast the net wide 
but they know they're going to have to narrow it and focus yeah. it. Uh, so, uh, and they also want to be inclusive, which I think is very healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it does pose challenges to management of the preparatory process when you engage so many outside the G20 in it. But there's no question that's a very healthy thing that they're trying to do. I, I just worry that uh, the amount of time they have is very short. Mm -hmm. um, there are still many things we need to get done on the financial regulatory agenda, on uh, the issues around uh, you know stimulus versus uh, uh, combined with uh, fiscal consolidation, two important messages out of Toronto, the need to continue to reform um, uh, the IMF governance mm -hmm. structures, which are still falling behind, further replenishments of, as I said, the development funds. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to do in the G20. And if the, uh, if the Koreans can get a uh, solid start on a very focused development agenda along the lines we've been discussing, I think that's a big plus. Mark, did you have some thoughts? Uh, I, I would agree with Ambassador Edwards that this is really a, a work in progress and that we're at the very beginning. As uh, he noted, uh, the first phone call on the development agenda uh, under the Korean uh, summit is tomorrow. Uh, and so uh, it's likely that we'll see a considerable narrowing of the focus uh, by the time uh, we get uh, to the fall. Um, and that, uh, you know, one of the, the really important things that this demonstrates is, is this notion of, of a division of labor. So if you've got the G8 working on uh, more traditional development assistance uh, or humanitarian assistance type uh, projects, mm -hmm. um, then not everybody from the G20 needs to jump on board there. There are other aspects of development uh, as opposed to development assistance that, that we can deliberatively, um, you know, forge this division of labor so that we're all working to our respective strengths and uh, achieving more uh, than we would if we were uh, duplicating our efforts mm -hmm. and being inefficient. Mm -hmm. I actually wanted to get at that point of, of division of labor or the flip side of being collaboration and, and um, coordination. And going back to the G8 specifically in, in Muskoka, um, one way to think about accountability going forward is what the you know the delivery on the commitments is. The other way is is how are the partners that have already agreed to be part of the Muskoka initiative in the G8 and elsewhere talked at all about coordinating their efforts to take advantage of who is best situated um, to do what interventions and, and, and use the opportunity as one for better coordination on the ground. I'd be curious to hear if that conversation is in the works or that came up in, in the discussion around the initiative. Well, why don't I start, Mark, and you know, uh, you're closer to this accountability report than I was, but uh, I know that on the accountability report, it's, it's more than just numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we were looking at how money's being spent effectively the impact that it's having and so on. Now, admittedly, it's that too is a work in progress because uh, there are, you know, you, 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 you need guidelines and so forth against which to measure effectiveness and so on. Uh, the numbers are one thing and, you know, uh, if you just focus on the numbers, uh, you get a mixed picture. But you need to go beyond that. You also need to go beyond, and here's why I think the G8 has played an important role, is, is, is the catalytic nature of the, of the aid it's put in place and the changes that have been brought uh, through these very significant sums that uh, they put in place. And the accountability report does, does make some comment on that. Um, in Muskoka, we had a chance, uh, again through our African uh, leaders present, to talk about accountability. And um, a number of the African leaders in the room uh, expressed their interest in following up on that discussion further. In fact, the AU African Union is doing their own accountability report, uh, which is to be made public at some point over the course of the summer. Um, and there is an interest in really joining these mm -hmm. two efforts up. So you, you begin to look at the continuum of the donor accountability <coughs> versus the recipient accountability and everything in between, including those, uh, those institutions we turn to to help deliver, the plans and so forth that are in place to help deliver. So I think this is, uh, this is something, a very healthy development, which is going in a, a positive direction. Sure, and, and I would say that uh, you know, the G8 process uh, is a very important first step toward uh, the larger joint action plan uh, that will be uh, you know, launched at uh, the NDG uh, high-level plenary review. And that will also afford an opportunity for greater donor coordination. Uh, so I think uh, you know, implicit in the Muskoka initiative is uh, a need for coordination, mm -hmm. uh, who's doing what and where and with whom. 
Uh, and that uh, type of uh, thinking is, is fundamental to the Global Health Initiative in which we're trying to uh, forge deliberate alliances both with our uh, partners uh, in governments and in private philanthropical organizations uh, to align behind country-led uh, plans to improve health systems. And I think that uh, will carry through into the fall uh, as we reach the high level of planning. Thank you.